So welcome everybody uh, from Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. This is the fourth series of Hatch Global. And today we have a special guest from Netherlands, uh, His Royal Highness Constantine Van Orang. Um, firstly, let me introduce you to the organizations that's putting this webinar together. Hatch. Hatch is a place uh, for innovation, growth, and collaboration. It's a central hub <coughs> for all things startup. Hatch is the home for hungry entrepreneurs in Asia. The vision of Hatch is to transform the business culture by providing genuine opportunities for entrepreneurs to experiment freely, acquire knowledge, collaborate deeply, and thrive successfully as, as a community. We built a space that encourages budding entrepreneurs to incubate, collaborate, and accelerate. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be, great to be uh, here. Uh, my name is Ijaz. I'm from Bangladesh. I run the Bangladesh Youth Leadership Center, uh, which provides young people uh, skills, instills in them values, connects them to jobs, and invests in them. BYC Ventures is our investment and accelerator program where we uh, support, we identify promising founders, invest in them, and help to take their business to the next level. Um, alongside BYC Ventures, we have uh, Seed Ventures with us from Pakistan. Uh, Seed is a social entrepreneurship and equity development organization uh, that works to uh, promote entrepreneurship across various landscapes and verticals, working with uh, micro enterprises, SMEs, uh, startups, universities, and school children. And we have uh, Pro Pakistani. Uh, it's the Pakistan's largest independent public sector tech uh, business and other news. It has over 136 million traffic to its site every year. And we're pleased to announce that we'll be, we are actually live streaming on Facebook, on the Hatch site, on the BYLC LC Ventures and BYLC Leadership, um, as well as Seed Ventures uh, Facebook sites as well. So Constantine um, needs no introduction. He leads the Tech Leap in the Netherlands, the accelerator for the tech ecosystem in Netherlands. As a special envoy, he's on a mission to turn the Netherlands into a unicorn itself. He and his team the Dutch tech ecosystem to help ambitious and promising Dutch tech companies grow first internationally, fast internationally, by improving their access to capital, market, and talent. Uh, Constantine co-founded Startup Fest Europe, which is still the biggest startup event ever organized in the Netherlands. He used to be the chief of staff of the European Commission in charge of the digital agenda as well. He is currently also the director of digital technology and macro strategy at, um, at Macro Advisory Partners in London and New York an Edge Fellow at the Deloitte Center of Edge, where the advisors, uh, advisors companies and European Commission on the Digital Innovation Strategies besides innovation and technology. Constantine, welcome to Hatch Global. It's uh, lovely to have you, and uh, Ijaz and I have known you for many years now, and it's great for uh, both of us to be uh, throwing a few fastballs at you today. I'm ready. <laughs> um, so, so first question is, Constantine, you have been a flag bearer for Europe and Netherlands over the past five years or more, driving entrepreneurship and startup culture. What's really worked and what would you advise for other countries and companies uh, from the learnings that you've had? Oh, wow. It's, um, well, we've seen that there was a lot of ambition of, of uh, governments, particularly, to want to be innovative, to want to... Uh, drive startup um, ecosystem. This has been mostly, I'd say, I think the UK was a bit ahead of the pack, but uh, it's mostly something of the last 10 years and, um, and even the last eight years. And um, I'm, um, you've seen accelerators being set up and a lot, a lot of public money being invested and uh, a lot of activities around universities and all that. And that's all good. I think, I think the, the extra emphasis on entrepreneurship connected with innovation, not just innovation as some kind of an extension to research, I think is very good. Um, but uh, in the end, it's the market that needs to do it. In the end, it needs to be, you know, commercial venture capital, commercial accelerators uh, that, that need to be driving the ecosystem. And I think there, uh, I think uh, there's a, um, the government initiatives can, need to really take that into account, need to, need to, um, stimulate the market uh, uptake instead of trying to replace it. So you're seeing a lot of places, a lot of m public money flowing into this uh, this tech sector, 
and on the on the long run that's not a good thing so um, the more uh, governments are um, um, enabling the market to take up uh, the better I think it is and if you take for example uh, events such as CES how important is it for governments to be supporting entrepreneurs and, and startups to be going there? How successful has it been for the Netherlands? Well, for us, it was really successful. Though it's a bit of an oddity that you have a country pavilion because you have startups that are in robotics or in drones or um, you know self-driving cars, but also in blockchain or um, even medical, um, you know, med tech companies. And uh, and it's just, just to put them into, under a, a national flag is a bit odd because uh, a robotic company would probably be better positioned in uh, in a section with robots, etc. But CES is so big that uh, with 100, 180,000 participants, it sometimes helps these small companies to uh, to create some critical mass. And uh, for that, it's been uh, it's been very useful. CES uh, is one of those unique uh, gatherings where the whole world um, comes together, the whole world of tech. So it's not just American. So it's not just the companies that want to go to uh, expand into America, but it's also you also find actually. A lot of our companies have met uh, Dutch executives that they wouldn't have met in the Netherlands, but they meet them at CES. Um, you have investors there, you have uh, media. So the, really the full mix of, um, of interest for a company that has uh, an international ambition. So uh, for us, it's been, it's been really good. We keep bringing like about 50 uh, early stage companies there. And, um, and that's been, uh, it's been relatively successful. We try to downplay a bit the, the, that, is, that it's about Dutch, and we try to really put the, uh, the entrepreneur central stage. So those of you guys who's joining us uh, from all over South Asia, uh, please log in your name and um, say what, what, what you do. And uh, if you've got any questions, please do put it into either the chat room or into the Facebook page. Um, we, we will be taking questions uh, with Constantine towards the um, end of this uh, chat, and we've got over a thousand people following uh, this conversation as we speak. Um, so, Constantine, you were very gracious. Uh, when Sri Lanka had at least a bombing, um, you were one of the first people who said, I'm gonna come down at some point, and, and you kept your promise, and you came down in, in June, and subsequently that same month, you also went to Bangladesh for BYLC's uh, leadership summit as well. And you got to meet some entrepreneurs. You got to see the sights of the country. Um, what's the feeling you got from South Asia when you visited here? Um, well, it's difficult to just call it as one whole South Asia. I think there are very, uh, very big differences, but also uh, probably things in common. Uh, the entrepreneurial drive, which I like really well, but you know, this is you obviously showed me some of the spaces that were uh, full of entrepreneurs and a lot of young people, uh, but particularly in in Bangladesh, the, the energy of the young people to want to really improve their world, to reach across uh, boundaries, to uh, um, to to co-create your own future. I think that was really powerful. And um, and to see that that whole uh, from all parts of the country, people coming together to work together. That was uh, that was uh, for me uh, very inspiring. Um, and in and Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is a, is a, is a beautiful country, and uh, I mean, you have you guys have everything there, and uh, so I'm, I'm pretty jealous. Would love to come back uh, soon, uh, but also what you're doing at the Hatch is uh, is is quite amazing. Um, you've been uh, really drawing in a lot of also international attention, uh, and I think that's important. Startups don't just stay within their own um, uh, geography. It's really important to connect these kind of hubs internationally and you've managed to do that um, across not only uh, the region but also uh, um, into the US into Europe uh, so it, it, was, it was nice to be in such a vibrant um, ecosystem you just want to wonderful I, I think uh, let me just uh, uh, build on uh, Nathan's point I think uh, we, we brought you to uh, South Asia I think the context here is quite different from developed countries, right? As you have seen. So when we are talking about uh, the CES, we're talking about new frontiers in consumer technology uh, and they apply to advanced markets, advanced economies. But in South Asia, if you look at the reality of 2020, um, you know, tourism, which is the big sector in Sri Lanka, apparel is a big sector in Sri Lanka, 
migrant workers provide a lot of remittance for Bangladesh and many other South Asian countries. So our economies have been very badly hit because of this. And a lot of migrant workers are coming, uh, coming back. Uh, a lot of young people are getting unemployed. So one question I have uh, for you is, from your experience, a uh, lot, uh, lo lot of the people in this audience from South Asia, uh, particularly those who are in business, are keen on exploring new opportunities in European markets. Uh, what are the sectors that you think uh, would be thriving in countries like Netherlands? And what opportunities can South Asian entrepreneurs uh, sort of have, or how should they be thinking about uh, pivoting their businesses? I know it's a, it's, it's a hard question, but maybe you can. There are many, many questions in there. Um, so I think um, if you look at it at a macro le level, this, this um, crisis has put some pressure on uh, global supply chain. So um, we have a lot of talk about uh, supply chain uh, resilience, uh, so shorter supply chains, local for local. So uh, that will definitely have an impact, I think, in the, in, um, um, in, in the value chains as, as they have developed that were very much focused on um, high efficiency. And, uh, and so I, was, I assume there will be a shift towards more resilience um, um, that doesn't mean that um, we will be seeing the end of globalization. I think there's still many opportunities and, uh, and the whole um, digitization of the economy makes it uh, much more, uh, much easier to scale businesses and to, and to run a business from one part of the world and, and, and as to deliver services and goods at the, at the other part. So that is actually um, uh, accelerating at the same time. Um, so well, what we're seeing here is obviously, well, as I just mentioned, everything is going digital. Um, any, any sector or value chain that is not digital yet is likely to become digital or disrupted. Um, sectors that have been largely um, uh, analog still, like education, also healthcare, are rapidly changing into fully digitized and, uh, and, and are, are turning into big commercial markets, I think, uh, especially healthcare, which has always been a bit slow, uh, but the, the current crisis has really accelerated that. Um, all kinds of things around food delivery, um, delivery to the home, last mile delivery, um, uh, intelligent logistics, those things are, are very likely to, to excel further. Um, the medical space. Um, so there are actually we're seeing a few different categories of companies, some of them that are in the sweet spot and they're going really fast. Uh, um, and they, they're actually um, looking for uh, for additional funding and uh, to to expand. Um, then you have companies that are uh, that have been uh, pivoting, and some of them have, in, have done an incredible job. That are in sectors that are really difficult, like the travel sector or the event space, and they've been managing to uh, reuse their technologies and, and develop new markets. Uh, then you have a number of businesses that are just just dead. I mean, they they uh, they are in sectors that are not going to move for the next uh, two years, and that's going to be really really difficult. And then you have completely new uh, things emerging. Um, and and this is, you know, for instance, the the six foot economy. I don't know how you'd call it, or we have the one and a half meter economy uh, for social distancing. Uh, that sparked a lot of creativity in how you how you deal with people in in public spaces. And for instance, a, a Dutch company that didn't even exist um, uh, two months ago. It's called uh, Aura Aware, which gives a gives a sign if you come too close to the shop counter, and uh, and it's a it's a much more elegant way of telling people to hold their distance. And they are now shipping internationally and going really uh, going really well. Um, uh, we have a company that is um, um, sorry for that. I don't know if the screen the screen went out, but. Um, the uh, a company that is um, involved in 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 testing COVID testing, it's a, a photonic chip which uh, which which are now testing and it and it comes close to 100 percent and within within uh, about four minutes it can test uh, the virus. These companies obviously are um, if they manage to get the technology working and if they manage to get it on a good platform, they, those could be really really accelerating and they didn't even exist a few uh, a few weeks ago. So. Some very exciting stuff going on, but as you said, some very tragic sectors. We've seen textile obviously being extremely difficult. Uh, uh, um, the uh, as again the, the 
the creativity of making mouth, you know, face masks and others. So there are other opportunities that, that we can make, but in, on the whole, the sector has been in a very difficult state. Uh, tourism, obviously, really problematic and travel. So many economies um, uh, over the world, uh, and as you mentioned, well, your country, of course, and, and, and sure Sri Lanka, de Sri Lanka, depending also a lot on tourism, but also Southern Europe, really badly hit by this, and uh, and we haven't even started to see the uh, the overall consequences. Nathan, um, I I think I would also like to uh, ask you a question. Um, yes. You know, you spent many years uh, working at MS Holdings, which is one of the largest uh, apparel uh, producers in South Asia. Um, what is your assessment of the RMG sector in South Asia? On one, one hand, we heard about, you know, Constantine talking about the supply chain. There is distrust over China. Um, and there is uh, overall a global depression, uh, reduced uh, real income of individuals to spend on clothing. A lot of apparel sort of retailers filing for bankruptcy. Where, where is South Asia headed uh, in terms of the apparel sector over the next 12 to 18 months in your assessment? So uh, thanks, Ijaz. I mean, normally I do the questions, but uh, I'll answer this. <laughs> but uh, I think there has been a, a, a large shift. And when I say large shift, um, I mean, Sri Lanka is very strong with the US market and Bangladesh uh, because of GSP Plus has always been strong with Europe as well, and, and so has uh, Pakistan been very strong with the US. Uh, when you look at um, the current market and what um, Bangladesh has been really good at and Pakistan's been very good at has been um, bulk manufacturing, i.e. Uh, producing uh, in, in uh, apparel terms in the, by the dozens. Um, so when customers give you orders, they give you orders by the dozen. That's gonna go away, and that's gonna be the biggest uh, thing that, that you guys will have to get used to because people are going to move digitally. Many of the businesses that have brick and mortar is going to uh, shut down many of those stores and they're going to see that digital channel come through. That means that the order sizes are not going to be in your millions of pieces anymore. Uh, you know, you have to get to that one piece uh, order at some point as well, but you may not be able to get there immediately, but that is uh, the plan that each of the companies in this region must be thinking of. Um, but on the second um, side of that, or the flip, flip side of that, is there is an opportunity because there's over 2 uh, billion people in this region. And that 2 billion people have clothing that can be manufactured as well. We never think of the local market ourselves as a first instance. We always think that people in the local market want the cheapest product. But actually, things are changing. And the center of gravity for wealth has been moving towards the West for many years. But the, the, the current indicator is that by 2025, the central gravity is going to come back to where it was, which was in Asia. So there is a massive opportunity for Asian manufacturing companies to be getting into those um, industries uh, where they're servicing the customers in Southeast Asia and South Asia uh, and even China. Um, and the last point on this is, as, as Constantine said, there is an opportunity for PPE products, masks, etc. Um, in Sri Lanka, for example, the U.S. government, uh, through one of the customers, has brought in around 200 million PPE masks to, to be manufactured um, in uh, Sri Lanka, and it's been split amongst many of the manufacturers uh, in the country. And they, because of that, they have been sort of their capacities have been filled up till about July, August of this year, and that's that's the uh, support that's come through. So people. Are into many products, people are shifting into more, uh, what I would say, curated products um, and also customized products as well. So I think that's where the real market is uh, moving towards. And uh, I think Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan have a great advantage even over Sri Lanka is that you have your potential to have that supply chain. And we talked about that earlier when Constantine answered as well. Supply chain is going to be the greatest differentiator in this industry. Thank you. Great. Constantine, one, yeah. one a lot of people are asking on, on the chat at the moment, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, someone from uh, Pakistan asking this question. Um, if you really look at entering um, uh, Netherlands or Europe, uh, what is the first thing that people should be thinking about? And what are the, um, what's the advice you would give them? Is it a difficult market to enter? What's the readiness levels that they need to look for? What are the top three things that they should be really looking at? 
Well, I think always if you go into a new market, it, it, you have to understand that the market is, um, no market is the same. So Europe is not one market. Um, same as you go to say Southeast Asia and, and you, would make, you might establish yourself in Singapore, but if you want to, uh, um, even if you want to set up, you deliver your business in Malaysia, it's going to be a different. People purchase in a different way. Uh, so a lot of the, uh, uh, you have to understand local structure. So that's really about how you're understanding your customer, uh, understanding how things work. That's one. Two, um, the involvement of governments is quite different from country to country. So it's, for instance, in the Netherlands, there's going to be very limited in involvement. Uh, so you will find quite limited support by the government to to roll out your business. But we the, there, the, the philosophy is we try to create a, a, a business environment that is, uh, that is very beneficial. Um, um, so it depends. I think, um, uh, so it is understanding the local market to understanding that Europe is not uh, not one market, but there are many markets and they uh, and also the obviously languages and other differences. And three um, would be, um, 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 I think, um, um, probably, well, if you come from Asia, probably you have to, you, you, it would be good to find a local partner, um, though that's obviously not required, but it's, uh, it will really help you, um, given all of the cultural biases that, uh, that there may be around, uh, around the use of certain products and projects. Um, so yeah, I think that's, a, that's a probably a generic answer anywhere you go. Um, and then there's the, obviously the legal stuff, but that's, uh, that's just uh, something you have to deal with. Uh, if you're a bigger company, um, you might want to also look at um, um, getting a tax ruling. Um, every country will have some kind of an opportunity to, uh, to structure your taxes. Um, then, um, yeah, that's, that's probably that would be the, the four things you could do. The, the, the one thing that uh, you mentioned there was language and in Europe you have uh, I think over 24 or 25 languages that's in that uh, in the country so yeah um, in the EU yeah. in, in the EU itself and, and when you look at even when you look at Italy and you look at different parts of Italy it's very different how they trade and things like that so how important is the language piece to you I mean if you were going and you wouldn't probably you would go to more probably the more English speaking countries yeah uh, yeah, so typically companies from uh, from outside Europe would come to an English-speaking country or actually the Netherlands because we have a, um, most of the professional world is, is, is relatively bilingual. Um, and uh, so, But that's your ease of op operation, right? So you, if you come to Amsterdam or Rotterdam, you can actually, uh, you, you can live in life speaking English. There's no problem. Um, and London obviously used to be the, uh, the, the default option, but now as it's now um, exiting the European Union, um, um, many countries and companies are looking for alternatives. And in the, the tech, uh, given the developers and, and, um, and also um, uh, coding language is all, is all English uh, based. So that community is largely English speaking and in, you know, independent if they come from Eastern Europe or Northern Europe or from the U.S. and um, and then if you are a tech company, you probably want to be somewhere where there's a lot of um, uh, good talent available and there's a lot of versatility and there's a good uh, international community. So you probably look at hubs like uh, like Amsterdam or London or uh, um, Berlin, Paris. Those are the places you'd, uh, you'd you'd probably look to establish your business because it's uh, it's it's relatively easy to do business. Um, another thing, Amsterdam, for instance, has a very good connectivity by planes. Now, obviously, we're not flying anymore, but uh, once that uh, that returns, that used to be a really important um, um, uh, important criteria for establishing yourself because from from Amsterdam, you have I don't know something like 150 uh, countries that you have direct flights to, which is uh, is obviously very convenient. In, in Asia, Constantine, what, what, the two countries that people look to start, um, register their companies are one is in Singapore, the second one being Hong Kong um, in Asia. Yep. And, and suddenly, uh, and it's been there for many years for larger companies, but 
Netherlands is seen as a, a good uh, country to really register uh, your startup in. And, and, and a lot of the attraction is also because the opportunity with European funding uh, that's there as well. So, so what are, that's one of the questions that's come in. Uh, well, all the countries have the same European funding opportunities, so that's not uh, that's not going to be a differentiator. I think it's relatively easy. Uh, there's a, it's a very business friendly environment, so it's easy to start your company. Um, there have been issues around um, uh, bank accounts, opening a bank account because of uh, KYC requirements and a, uh, AML. Uh, uh, but that's also something which is basic. Uh, we have really good institutions like central bank financial um, supervisors so it's pretty easy I think that's the, the thing easy to start your business and to find talent um, and that especially for smaller companies is, uh, is, is really important and then uh, the Netherlands is quite an easy place to uh, to expand out of I mean it's uh, it's it's a small compact country you're close to um, uh, to, to the UK German market uh, France well connected by rail and and, and planes, so um, that's I think what uh, what what makes it attractive. And then we have quite quite a, a relatively high number of multinational companies like uh, Shell and Unilever and uh, and, a, and, a, and a quite a strong financial uh, service uh, sector. So all in all, it makes it um, it makes it an interesting place. Um, but it's not it's not like Singapore. I mean, we don't. It's not it's because it's, obviously it's not a city. It doesn't manage. It's not managed in the same way. And um, and we're not uh, say optimized for being the uh, the landing the landing place for international companies. Um, though we're working on it. I mean, I think it's a very important if you want to be an international tech ecosystem that uh, the tech talent and then, and then you know, this, the, the, the companies that are going to kind of grow in the future uh, want to establish themselves in your country because it, uh, it, it really is a, it's important to have a dynamic ecosystem. Absolutely. Um, I want to uh, shift a little to, uh, to nature and sustainability, at least in South Asia, because of this lockdown, what we have seen is pollution levels going down you know, many birds are coming out. We are seeing, you know, nature, uh, what we saw before uh, this crisis is growth with a blatant disregard for sustainability and nature, uh, which has, uh, this pandemic has forced us to slow down and, you know, pay more attention to nature and appreciate nature in some ways. In your assessment, uh, Constantine, in the post-corona world, uh, will you see, uh, do you see businesses paying more attention to sustainability and what uh, uh, Riyasat Zaman from Bangladesh has asked particularly is uh, will the industry want to incorporate uh, eco-friendly packaging and products in their supply chain? Will there be a greater attention to eco-friendly packaging and more sustainable measures in businesses from the European uh, standpoint? Yeah, thanks for asking the question. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's one of those things we, we really hope for. We hope that uh, the crisis at least um, gives us opportunity to do things better and not to revert to, to the past. Um, somebody actually on a call I had earlier said it's difficult to be green when you're in the red. So um, if you are um, fighting for survival, it's different, difficult to... Um, to to think about um, uh, pivoting your strategy and and looking for you know new su new supply chains that are more eco friendly etc. But the governments are very concerned about this and there's a lot of public money now flowing into the economy and that comes with a with certain conditionality. So even the support to national air carriers will have some kind of a condition that it uh, that that when they return to the markets that they will have a greener uh, or a, a, a reduced footprint. Um, and I think that that is m more or less the, 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 common, the common view that um, the economy should not revert to the past and that we should use the crisis to connect it with the Green Deal. So in Europe, we have um, two big policy domains. One is the digitization part and the other is green part. And, uh, the ambition is of the politicians and uh, policymakers is to uh, now, as we are pouring uh, fresh uh, capital into into the market, that that is actually accelerating the green and the digital uh, part to make the economy more future proof. And uh, and I'm I'm sure that 
that any any kind of I mean, and we've seen this actually from the investor point of view too. That's probably the biggest driver, is that uh, institutional investors are now actually demanding this from the companies that they are bailing out. Um, that they demanding that these companies are actually uh, pivoting towards much more ecologically friendly and uh, um, so in, in packaging, but also in their supply chain and in um, in, in many of their processes. So yes, I I'm I'm optimistic. And I, I hope that this, uh, this crisis will at least, um, independent of all the carnage that it's doing, will actually deliver some good in this respect. We have a lot of interesting people that have joined in uh, to this chat. We have uh, Raj Kulasingham, who's the senior counsel at Denton's law firm. Uh, we have Hans Tutin um, join in. So lots of different people from different parts of the world listening to you, Constantine. And one of the questions I have, just to add on to what Ija said, is, with the oil prices coming to as low as it could be and people looking for bunkers and, and how to really keep oil for a while, um, the countries are going to get back in green power is, um, uh, and solar power over the last uh, 10 years have been coming down in cost uh, for establishing it. But still, uh, with oil and coal being cheap as, as, it, as it is today, are we going to go back to the old habits uh, and are the uh, Asian countries going to go back into that old habit of getting back into, um, you know, power that's not really sustainable in the future? Well, actually, solar has dropped even, even faster um, than anybody had expected. So um, in terms of, of competitiveness, it's, it's, it's now really a really interesting uh, energy source. Obviously, it's not as stable as uh, as as fossil fuels or uh, nuclear. Um, I'm not an energy expert, and um, I would I think uh, if um, if oil is so cheap, uh, it's going to be very hard to convince people not to use it. Um, so, and and um, many uh, politicians will be distracted. Many business. So, um, I don't know. I don't know. I think. Um, on the user side, um, people, I don't know how it's in, in, in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka but um, here people have really reconsidered using their cars and, and, you know, and, 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 and travel. And I, I hope that there's going to be a, a clear a decrease in, in the use of, uh, of um, automotive, auto, you know, of cars, but also a switch to electrical vehicles. Um, but, um, um, uh, I, I, I would love to be optimistic, but I think, uh, with, with these oil prices, the demand will simply, uh, bounce back and, and there is, uh, the alternative is, is just not that financially, not that interesting. Um, how do you see this? Do you see a, a, a trend where, um, there is a real switch, um, to electrification and, uh, and, and other energy sources? I think that in, in South Asia, still energy is a major issue. So uh, whatever could give uh, the fastest uh, uh, opportunity to get everybody on the grid is going to be used. So I, I, I still feel that whilst the country's hearts are in the right place for renewable energy, um, unfortunately, some of the other coal plants and uh, oil operated plants will still yeah. collapse in the next 10 years. Um, but I mean, that, that's something that, you know, we have to be the flag bearers and, and, and bring in uh, more sustainable uh, our businesses as well as everyday life, as you said. So there is a huge saving that people have seen by not going to work, um, not only from a rental of buildings, but also from the fact that they're not using their cars, bikes, or tuk-tuks to get to work. And um, that, that, I hope, is an opportunity for people to see that they could uh, work differently in, in their jobs. Uh, a question that's come out um, uh, is around, what do you think um, stage two of COVID is, when the economy recovers, um, and what sort of themes are you going to see in the industry? What are the new opportunities surfacing up? Is it food security? Is it data? Uh, or is it security uh, overall in, in communication? Um, you were 
Well, we've seen a lot of uh, issues with uh, cybersecurity um, as many companies when you know move their operations uh, um, online and uh, or in the cloud and, and started communicating uh, uh, remotely. Um, so there are going to be many issues there, um, but they already are. So, and I think the more we're going to see um, that the, the economy depends on uh, telecommunication networks, uh, the more there will be people trying to exploit that. Um, uh, the, uh, so, so that's, that's definitely an issue. Um, I think um, we will see, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not a specialist in these things, but I think that with the, uh, you would you'd probably see some kind of a, um, a bounce back and then, and then this, especially in, in countries that have picked their, um, their uh, lockdown or, and their opening up strategy to ICU capabilities. And uh, um, that's the kind of uh, the, the criteria to, to release or to tighten again. So I think we'll see a lot of that um, and, and trying to keep control over a new spread of the disease and that will determine the economy. Um, in my country, we're seeing a lot of uh, experimentation now with different sectors opening up and how to do that within the uh, 1.5 meter economy. Um, uh, and, and people are reassessing their business models, obviously, because if you depend on larger uh, numbers of people, uh, and that just basically in restaurants, et cetera, just doesn't add up. Um, so they'll have to find uh, either different spaces or different ways of serving. So everybody is kind of finding their way, but we, or I would assume that at least for the next half year we'll be in this kind of uh, situation where where measures might tighten and might weaken. So there's not going to be a lot of um, um, time for entrepreneurs to basically consider a new normal. I think the new normal will be in flux for quite a time. There's a question here from uh, uh, Sunil. Um, and it's around these tech companies. So, you know, we had the time when Exxon uh, was one of the largest companies. GM used to be one of the largest companies. And they're all getting overtaken by these tech companies today. You know, the Facebooks of the world, the Amazons of the world, Googles of the world, the Ubers of the world. And it's become a consumer-driven uh, economy. Um, I always remember this quote about Ford cars coming out in... in the, uh, but why is it a consumer-driven economy? I mean, they're all delivering... A lot of uh, B two B service. I mean, um, uh, AWS of uh, Amazon is an uh, is an incredible cloud engine. Um, the, the most of what Amazon is is basically providing a platform for other businesses, and is actually B two B business. So, actually, what we're seeing is that these uh, these large tech companies have uh, are, are very much on the on the pulse of the time, and they are delivering the services, be it. Um, uh, video conferencing services, or be it you know cloud cloud services, data uh, data and file sharing services, all of these things that are critically important in uh, in this in this current trend. And if we see now Amazon going into healthcare and Google and Apple maybe going into education, you so you see really uh, that they're moving into markets that they weren't before because they uh, they are data driven because they are you know they have the the, the capital to invest in. The underlying AI and other and other technologies, like no one else can. So um, they they have the ability to move relatively fast into spaces uh, where uh, you see that the economy is is quite slow in uh, in transforming, and uh, and that's basically where we are. And that's why I think a lot of policymakers are getting concerned with uh, with the, the power because it's like a self fulfilling prophecy. Once you once you're there, you get more data. The data gives you gives you better services, etc. And you get a very strong concentration of power in a number of companies. Um, just uh, building on that, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, keeps me up at night is the large number of young people in South Asia entering the job market every month and the number of jobs available. We have more than a million young people entering the job market in South Asia every month. Because of this uh, COVID-19, uh, many of for migrant workers will be coming back as soon as the airports uh, open. So we will end up with a huge number of young people. Some of them have lost jobs. Some of them are entering the job market, struggling to find jobs, and some migrant workers coming back to the country. Uh, you, you spoke about, you touched upon AI and uh, data-driven companies uh, and economies. Countries like uh, you know, uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, we're not data-driven 
uh, economies. Uh, we are not, AI is not our core competence. Therefore, uh, there is a huge need right now for reskilling uh, our workforce. When, when you think about reskilling or when you think about the skills in your estimation will be critical for success uh, in a post COVID-19 world, what skills come to your mind and how can uh, the youth of our countries uh, prepare themselves? Well, I think um, many of those were already there. So I think entrepreneurship is really important and uh, um, uh, because that makes you more resilient and more independent. You can, it's making something yourself, not depending on other organizations. So entrepreneurship skills are important. Teamwork, teamworking skills are important. Uh, being able, you know, your flexibility, your agility is really important. You're seeing that we're now, you know, we're used to working in one way. We're now shifting to a completely different way. And it's the people that are able to do that and are able to apply the tools to, uh, to continue working and to continue deliver, being productive, uh, those people are going to be successful. And we've seen that in all across our economy, we've seen that also in, the, in, a, in a relatively mature economy as the Netherlands, where you find now that the crisis is actually showing very clearly who, is the, who are adapting and who are not. And But we've been talking about reskilling and about uh, the future of work for a long time and how AI and robotics and all would actually improve, um, influence um, the job market and and what the crisis has been doing is basically is basically accelerating that and um, so governments and and companies you know have over the years talked about this and uh, and have not done very much and now um, it's the time to actually take all those plans take all those reports and start doing it and I think reskilling is is of major importance in all our economies we find that especially older people but also people with uh, with uh, less uh, privileged backgrounds are um, are finding it hard to connect with this uh, with this new world, and uh, maybe they don't have the right devices, maybe they don't have the right training. Uh, but this is really where the world is going to. And uh, um, and we, before we discuss supply chains, I think there again, in some ways, parts of Asia are much further than we are uh, in in terms of autom automation and uh, robotization and also the, uh, the application of AI. And actually we find that our systems are more analog and we're not connecting that well. We've seen that now with the whole um, uh, PPE and, uh, and, and uh, uh, face mask discussions where uh, you know, the, the, actually the, the factories that are producing this and the supply chains are requiring a certain level of you know, technology that, that are not always here. Um, and so, so that is actually the more hopeful thing is that um, in, I think in, in South Asia or Asia as general, there's a lot of uh, technology uh, advancement. There's a lot of innovation going on. And, and so there's in the region, there's a lot of potential. And uh, as Nathan was saying, there's a bit of a the shift from the West back to, to Asia. And, uh, and that shift on a macro scale is, is, is likely to be very good for your countries. But also, obviously on the short term, um, in the micro scale, it's gone really hard where the industries that we mentioned before, like tourism and textiles, and you know, will have to go through quite a considerable re, uh, reshaping to uh, to become the job uh, the job engines that uh, or be replaced by other industries that kind of take up the jobs of the people that are now looking for them. And um, yeah, it, it, it it's 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 likely to be hard. It's going to be hard everywhere, but in countries that are uh, low on, on on digital skills. Uh, this this push has to be really quite radical, I think. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, I want to also uh, take a question from uh, Hans Tuten. He's a Dutch entrepreneur, also an advisor uh, to Palm Netherlands, and he's, uh, he's also uh, worked in Bangladesh. Um, it is difficult for startups in the Netherlands and other countries of Europe to attract software engineers, for instance, uh, and uh, as also identified by TechLeap. There appear there are a lot of talented software uh, engineers uh, in countries like Bangladesh. How can we better capitalize on the opportunity this seems to present? Uh, well, one, um, I don't think we we you would benefit a lot from a huge brain drain of these talents. It would be great if you could, and that's what you're doing with uh, with your institute uh, is training people and giving people opportunities in your own countries um, to build businesses there and to be relevant and, de and deploy their skills. Um, that if 
people want to come to, to Western Europe or the US, obviously there are uh, visa requirements and these things. But if above a certain threshold of income, um, there, there, it is actually quite easy to, uh, to attract uh, a talent from abroad, but you obviously have to prove that the talent brings something special and that you can't find a, uh, a native hire. Uh, but I know, for instance, of a company that uh, moved from Silicon Valley, moved to the Netherlands because they're in the U.S. They were now experiencing difficulties with uh, attracting a foreign talent. And they moved to the Netherlands because it was relatively easy to do it there. And um, so um, it's always it's uh, migration is always kind of problematic in, in, in some ways. But for high skilled migrants, there are, um, the, uh, the the accreditation paths, the visa paths are actually quite well uh, well established and you need a you need a kind of a local sponsor uh, but for instance if you are a startup and you want to go to Netherlands you can actually as a founder you can you can move uh, on a startup visa so you need a, a local accelerator or a local uh, incubator and they will then vouch for you and you they will actually support you to come over and what we're trying to do with uh, with TechLeap is to and with the uh, with the Ministry of uh, of Justice and Migration is to actually expand that uh, uh, that visa so that you can bring your founding team and critical uh, critical staff. So if you have a a UX uh, programmer a developer, then you would uh, uh, you know from uh, and you are a, a startup from uh, from Bangladesh and you want to bring him or her along, uh, that would that would be possible in the future. But the the law hasn't passed yet. Constantine, there's a question here from uh, Niranti. Um, the question is, um, you know, even the IT industry has been affected and it will be affected because there's a lot of people that in the Western world will lose jobs and have lost jobs over the last uh, six to eight weeks. Um, and the question is, you know, some of those jobs um, losses creates opportunities in Europe, whereas it takes away jobs from Asia as well. Uh, so for many years, jobs are being farmed out in the IT sector into Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India, uh, Pakistan. And now, again, there's an opportunity for countries to make and give opportunities for companies to recruit and have low taxes. So what's your view on this? And secondly, what should IT companies in South Asia be doing to ensure that they stay relevant? Um, well, like like every company that's now facing a problem is to be uh, very very well connected with your customers, knowing really well what they uh, what they want, providing uh, uh, thinking along with them and providing uh, superior services. Um, what we're seeing in the market is that uh, it's very sector dependent. So some uh, uh, there, there was a shortage of IT uh, staff. Now we're seeing that being reduced. Uh, um, I think that is has to do with larger um, corporates not investing that much anymore in, in in kind of their digital innovation programs. On the other hand, you find that uh, startups are going bust, uh, so they're releasing a lot of uh, stuff. In 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 the Netherlands, we have quite a generous program of the government that uh, tries to keep people in their jobs. Um, so even people that have not you know that you would otherwise lay off. Uh, they are they are for ninety percent subsidized, so they they stay in their jobs. So we don't see the full effect yet. Um, but not startups on the whole don't really have access to these programs, and they will have to decide. So if if there's a if there's market opportunities and they have see chance to grow, they will retain the staff, but otherwise they will cut relatively fast. And so that talent is actually on the market, and that is now moving. It's moving, and we're actually trying to facilitate some of the. Kind of a marketplace between uh, that talent moving to to other uh, tech companies that uh, that that are looking for talent, but it's uh, it's it's quite messy now, and um, uh, and and there is much more talent available. So, indeed, you could say um, uh, that uh, that is likely that there is less less demand for services from uh, from far. Um, and so all of the uh, the outsourcing uh, work is probably that's going to that's I assume that that is uh, less the intensity is less, and um, but we don't really know yet. But I think the big the big um, wave of uh, say unemployment wave of uh, still has to come. So the the big labor um, uh, effect of of COVID nineteen at least in our country is still uh, is still ahead of us. 
So here's a question from my co-founder, and he got excited when he spoke about AI because that's all he speaks to me about. Uh, but uh, the question is, the nomadic entrepreneur um, yeah. has always been go, finding places to travel and be inspired, and, and, and the place to go for the last few years was Bali. How can Bangladesh, Pakistan, or Sri Lanka become the place to go for this nomadic entrepreneur and uh, um, give your views on that? I, I think it comes down to um, access to capital, access to talent, uh, and access to market. So, and, and in the access to market, there's a lot about uh, uh, legisl legislations, permits, and, and that's what most governments get completely wrong. Uh, they make it really hard for companies to actually develop a business and it, it all looks easy but then uh, once you establish yourself uh, that can take longer than there are uh, bureaucratic issues uh, if you uh, if you get an investor the investor might not be able, is based abroad might not be able to invest in your in your company so all of these things typically what happens is that governments don't think from the perspective of the entrepreneur and so if you, if you would, if, if Bali or another place would basically set up a regime that, that, that takes the, uh, uh, the interest of the entrepreneur at heart, say, what, did, what do you need to set up a business? What do you need to expand your business? You know, how, do you, how does the entrepreneur get talent? How do you get access to technology? How do you, how did we, we optimally uh, facilitate them to get their funding? And, and if so, there's not a lot of local funding, then the funding must come from somewhere else. So if it's, if you want to establish yourself in, in, in Bangladesh, but the funding is mostly based in Singapore, you have to have access to that funding. And if that funding can't find its way into, into Bangladesh, then the business will just not grow there. And then the business will have to move um, to, to, to Singapore or to Bali or to some other place where, they, where it can thrive. So it's, it's um, typically governments are, you know, they, 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 they look at, you know, that world from their own perspective and, uh, and don't think through all of the aspects that, uh, that, that uh, come to play when you want to start and grow a business. And, uh, and you have to cover all of that. Otherwise, uh, even you know, if, you, if you're very good for early stage companies, and once they start growing uh, and they, they fill in, they still have to leave. So all the benefits of your policies are, are not you know, of employment and, and you know, any kind of increased innovation, all that will then actually go abroad anyway. So um, make it entrepreneurial friendly. And you know, and, and think through the uh, think through the logic of uh, of the entrepreneur. Um, a question again to detect everybody is: um, Netherlands has been a um, agriculture hotspot um, globally, uh, both in terms of uh, vegetables as well as uh, you know milk and other produce as well coming out of Netherlands. Um, and uh, when you look at uh, two countries specifically. Um, even you look at Pakistan and uh, Bangladesh, they're a huge, large in export of vegetables uh, as well. And then you look at Sri Lanka, you know, leading um, in terms of cinnamon and, and pepper and tea. So we rely a lot on agriculture as well. Unfortunately, these industries haven't attracted too much of technology and people, uh, and it's still very people dynamic. So uh, the question that's been asked is what technology could be brought into these countries uh, from places like Netherlands, and, and why is there an opportunity for the Netherlands government to participate in some of this as well? Again, then we're bringing the government in again, and uh, it's always hoping the government will do something. I don't, I don't really believe that. Um, I think um, so. If you look at the Netherlands, it's, it's very technology um, intense, and um, but that doesn't that. It also depends on what you apply your technology to. So if you apply the technology only to increase productivity, uh, that's uh, very different than kind of the tech way of thinking about uh, how do we um, develop, for instance, a platform that is highly scalable. So if you look at the Netherlands, our greenhouses are probably the most technologically advanced in the world. Uh, but um, if you were a tech entrepreneur, you would say, how can I develop a, a greenhouse concept or a platform for greenhouses that deal with the irrigation, with the energy uh, control, uh, and and all of that, to uh, and then and sell that technology all over the world, basically. And we're not seeing that. So, um, if you ask me, you know, what should, what kind of technologies do you uh, would you like to import to increase your productivity? 
then there are irrigation, there's irrigation technology. Uh, you know, the Israelis are also very good at that. And uh, there are, um, there are um, uh, innovations in seed, in seed quality. And, and so, you know, optimizing yield from, uh, from sort, certain uh, crops. All of those technologies we, we, would, we would have, and you could even you know, work with Wageningen University, for instance, to, to develop uh, certain um, uh, crops for, that are specific for, uh, for Sri Lanka or other things. Um, but all of that is about, uh, about optimization. And, and if you want to do something new, um, you have to think about, uh, um, about packaging and about supply chains, about um, uh, maybe many other things and the deliveries, the, all of the logistics around the food. There, there are many, many innovations are possible and have actually technologies that sometimes are more interesting than, than just the production, uh, the production uh, um, uh, technologies. So, he says, there's a question for you. Um, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, what are the opportunities you see in entering the Bangladesh market for all the startups there? Um, well, first of all, I think, you know, Bangladesh is very uh, receptive. We extend warm welcome to South Asians to come and work here, uh, particularly when it comes to Sri Lanka. Uh, as you know, we have uh, more than 25,000 uh, Sri Lankans working in Bangladesh in many different uh, mid-level and senior level leadership positions. So uh, we are very uh, welcoming to uh, South Asian uh, professionals and entrepreneurs coming and working here. In terms of uh, businesses, I think uh, uh, like rest of the world, what COVID-19 has done is it has reduced the real disposable income of individuals, right? So people will be focusing a lot on essentials and any startups investments uh, on essentials, tech enabled as Constantine had said, digital services, if you can find the intersection between essentials and technology enabled, I think there are a lot of opportunities. Um, there are you know, Sri Lankan investments in Bangladesh, uh, Indian investments in Bangladesh, so, uh, so a lot of opportunities for collaboration. I think a good starting point, a forum like this, where you know, South Asian entrepreneurs come together, dialogue is the starting point. And if we can have more conversations, I think uh, in any crisis, we need to collaborate. Resources are limited. So we have to collaborate, brainstorm, work together, and find ways to forge a common pathway for the future. So one final yeah. question, a couple of minutes, uh, Constantine. Um, in terms of what's inspiring you during COVID, is there a book that you're reading? Is there a site that you're visiting regularly? Um, other than obviously your three lovely kids and, and wife, uh, what are the other things that you're doing? Oh, I must say this is, uh, first it was a lot of COVID. Um, just reading everything, uh, all new reports. Uh, then it was a bit of a shift because I, I uh, started writing up my, you know, what this, all of this could mean for uh, basically my organization where where is innovation going um, in the next few years and what macro factors have an impact on this um, so we talked a bit about the supply chains but also uh, shifts in the in different um, in different between different sectors and um, so I read a lot of reports on that and it's been um, we've been the last two months been working around the clock to support startups and uh, get the government to um, develop um, bridge funding for for these startups, and uh, and we've now funneled uh, about thirteen hundred um, um, companies' request for a value of about six hundred million in um, in bridge loans. Um, so that's been really at the forefront of our activity, and and now we're looking forward. So we're looking at uh, what kind of what kind of opportunities does this crisis bring? What some of the things that have been um, impossible in the past now are possible uh there are now um uh, government as well is more open to to exploit new ideas and, and so um actually it's been a lot around that um at the same time my daughter did her was in her final exam so i can support her in that that was a uh, 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 testing but uh at least she uh, she actually made it she she, she graduated yesterday <laughs> so that's uh, that's good news and uh, and then uh, and my wife has actually is also has an organization that uh, we had actually hit quite some bad weather because of the COVID nineteen. So she had to fully restructure it and uh, 
um, and, and, and try to salvage it. And uh, so that was quite a humbling experience because you see your, a lot of your work uh, go up in, uh, go up in, in dust. Uh, but she managed to uh, to turn it around, and uh, and so yeah, we've been basically coping with many aspects of this crisis, um, but always trying to look forward. And uh, so it's been great also to uh, to to speak to you guys. Um, and uh, and 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 if you know um, you have to kind of look abroad, look to each other for inspiration. Um, so I've set up a few talks with you know also with. Uh, company CEOs about uh, you know their experiences and uh, it's it's very good to to get people to talk at a people to people level uh, because there's so much new in this and and you don't really have people to talk to um, we're trying to um, to pull a whole startup ecosystem through a crisis it's never never happened before we don't know how to do it we're experimenting as we go forward so it's really good to talk to people like you uh, that are having similar experiences in other parts of the world and. Uh, that's been that's been my inspiration for the last few uh, few weeks so uh no novels uh, i'm afraid no uh uh no not too much literature i actually skipped uh netflix uh, altogether so i haven't been spending much time there either um but it's been on these kind of issues absolutely before we end i must also uh so first of all you know constantine thank you so much for coming but none of us would be here without Nathan. So Nathan, a big thank you to you and to Hatch for uh, organizing this because you took the initiative. You brought us together and you know, uh, so thank you very much for putting this together. And I also want to thank all the attendees, all the participants of this webinar. They've been very active sending us questions. So thank you for uh, tuning in. And, uh, uh, and we hope that this was somewhat useful for those of you who joined us. So thank you from my side. Uh, a quick thank you to Hatch. Um as well as BYLC and BYLC Ventures, uh, Seed Ventures in Pro Pakistan, Pro, Pro, Pro Pakistani for hosting us tonight. And uh, Constantine, as usual, inspirational. You give us, leave us more energized and very gracious. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, we look forward to hosting you in Sri Lanka at BYLC and uh, also at Hatch at some point. Great. Thank you. Love thank you, everyone. You All right. Take care. Stay Good healthy. Well. Thank you. All right. You too.